G.K. Chesterton was not an official inkling. In fact, the only inkling he ever knew was Dorothy Sayers in person. Other than that, we don't have evidence of Lewis, who was greatly influenced by Chesterton, having ever met Chesterton himself, although their timelines overlap somewhat, but Lewis would have been a young man at the time that Chesterton was strolling through London quite a bit. Chesterton was born in 1874 and died in 1936. He was regarded as he was regarded as a journalist not only by himself but tried to popularize that understanding of the role that he played. He knew that he could never be anything but a writer. He was a prolific writer. He wrote more than many of us could write in our lifetime. In fact, most of the ways that he wrote were by dictation. He had a secretary who later became the executor of his estate, and he would dictate to her his ideas and she would write everything down. He could jump from one thing to the next, much like Thomas Aquinas used to jump from one question to the next, from scribe to scribe. Chesterton also could jump from one idea to the next, from one argument to the next. It was not uncommon for the man to be writing notes on napkins, to be writing without stopping regularly. Chesterton himself, when he decided to write a biography, he wrote it right before he died in 1936. It was actually the last thing that he wrote, so it was published posthumously. He begins his biography in a quite um, Chestertonian way. It is witty. It also points out a truth about the world. It tells you a little bit about his faith and also about his life. Chesterton begins his autobiography with this first sentence. Bowing down in blind credulity, as is my custom. So there you see the wit, right? Um, before mere authority and tradition of the elders. These are ideas that come, become commonplace in Chesterton's canon. Superstitiously swallowing a story I could not test at the time by experiment or private judgment. I am firmly of opinion that I was born on the 29th of May, 1874, on Camden Hill, Kensington, and baptized according to the formularies of the Church of England in the little church of St. George, opposite the large waterworks tower that dominated the ridge. I do not allege any significance in the relation to the two buildings, and I indignantly deny that the church was chosen because it needed the whole water power of West London to turn me into a Christian. So here we see in this opening passage, uh, Chesterton's ideas about the necessity of authority, about the necessity of revelation, about the necessity of taking truths according to common sense, according to tradition, and not necessarily having to prove everything according to rational or factual empirical evidence, that these are not the only ways to know truth. And he's undermining this in the opening statement of his autobiography. He also notes that he was baptized in the Church of England. Later, his family was mostly unit Unitarian, and so Chesterton himself did not have a strong faith growing up. He and his brother Cecil, in fact, would also dabble in the occult, which was very popular in the late 19th century, and uh, play with Ouija boards and things of this nature. Chesterton himself actually underwent a crisis of not even faith because he wasn't faithful, but a crisis of life, an existential crisis in his early 20s where he was wondering whether there was any point, whether he should continue living at all. It was a very dark, depressing time in his life, and we see him coming out of that in The Man Who Was Thursday, which probably he began writing in the late 1890s when he was going through this period. Uh, he was not yet a novelist. He was not well known. In fact, he was struggling to make ends meet. He had already met Francis Blogg, who he wanted to marry. They would marry in 1901. But at this time, he was trying to make a living as a writer and really not knowing what the purpose of life was for. And so he begins kind of dabbling with the ideas that would later become the man who was Thursday during this dark season of his life. To give more context to his biography, Chesterton was educated at St. Paul's in London, but he did not actually go on to the university. He went to the Slade School of Art. He thought he was going to be an illustrator, and instead he becomes a writer. As you see here, his evidence of being prolific, as I mentioned, of 100 books, 4,000 essays, including 30 years of a weekly column, three decades of writing a weekly column. 
He was a rather large man. He made his presence known to people. He was a cartoon figure in some sense that he really understood himself to be this large presence. 6'4", 300 pounds, with a cigar hanging out of his mouth, a cape around his shoulders, and a sword stick that he carried everywhere that he went. His wife, Frances Blog, was a more practical figure in his life. Uh, there are lots of stories about Francis and Chesterton. So Chesterton, for example, when they were first married, would go to pick up his check from the newspaper office and he would bring, have a, a cab, meaning a horse and carriage really, but he would have a handsome cab sitting outside and he would go inside to talk to people and would get so carried away in conversation as the handsome cab was still running that by the time he got back to the cab, all of his paycheck had been spent on the cab. And so Francis had to take over his finances and have all the checks sent directly to her and not to be picked up by Chesterton. There are other stories of his absent-mindedness that are rather famous. He would be walking around the city and telegram his wife, I'm at the corner of such and such and such and such, where am I meant to be? To which Francis responded, you should be home. So Chesterton was really the absent-minded professor, even though he wasn't a professor. This is kind of his um, modus operandi. And uh, one famous story has it that he would be sitting and arguing and was carried away at a restaurant and he was eating fried eggs and he hit the table with such force that the eggs came off and landed in his lap. And later when the waitress came over and asked if everything was okay, he said, yes, but I've seemed to misplace my eggs. Could you get me two more? And they were just in his lap as he was still talking without stopping. So this is what Chesterton would do. Um, his wife recalls that he would stay up at night practicing arguments with people who weren't in the room, that he continually was a nonstop personality. There's that famous Hamilton song, Why Do You Write Like You're Going Out of, uh, going out of grow Why Do You Write Like You're Running Out of Time? And Chesterton was really one of those people. He wrote nonstop, he was thinking nonstop, he was arguing nonstop. And it was because of this that he was invited into quite a few notable friendships and conversations the most famous one being with Hilaire Belloc, but also with who could be considered an adversary, but also a friend or a frenemy, George Bernard Shaw. They would do public debates together of atheism versus Christianity. And he got along with everyone, including the people that he disagreed with. He was friends with J.M. Bari, who wrote Peter Pan. He um, also met Winston Churchill. He talks about in his biography being at the same table together. Um, but realizing that Churchill had very little to say at the time, um, even though the two of them were both known as, uh, the both of them were known as rhetoricians or masters of language, and yet the two of them apparently had very little to talk about. So Chesterton was in these conversations with some of the most famous writers in Britain in the early 20th century. And his figure is large, not only literally, but figuratively, especially over the imaginations of the Inklings, as we'll see. And yet, for Americans, he seems to have been largely forgotten and not read about. Uh, the most common response when people read Chesterton is, why have I not read him before? Why have I not heard of him before? Because he does seem to be a rather large figure that we somehow forgot. Here's just a few famous sayings of Chesterton to kind of show that he himself was a figure of aphorisms in the same way that Nietzsche has been known as an aphoristic writer. Chesterton too was the king of aphorisms. The Christian ideal, and you'll see this in uh, orthodoxy, has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Right is right even if nobody does it. Wrong is wrong even if everybody is wrong about it. So fantastic. Fallacies do not cease to be fallacies because they become passions. Though we are all liars, we all love the truth. He knew how to speak quickly, concisely, and yet cut straight to the point. And you see this caricature of the man himself with his, uh, in this case, a cane, but usually it would have been a sword stick, and cigar, and his cape. So now let's talk about orthodoxy, and you see the, the growling, <laughs> almost bulldog figure on the front of orthodoxy, or at least on my copy. Um, the book Orthodoxy actually begins with a challenge. He recalls that he was standing with an editor at a bus stop, 
And while they're standing there, the editor points out a man and says, that man shall go far in life because he believes in himself. And Chesterton says, no, can I show you where the men are who most believe in themselves? They're in Hanwell. They're in the lunatic asylums. And the editor is very perplexed. You should write a book about that. Okay, I will. And Chesterton goes home and writes a book about it. And so Orthodoxy is the book that, that comes out of this. For him, it is a story of how to be a practical romantic, how to keep a sense of wonder and welcome. The wonder for the strange and the welcome for not just the stranger, but for the one that you want to become friends with. And so it was this constant um, move of paradox between things that seemed like they were opposed to one another and yet belong in the same place, that they need to be held in tension always so that one doesn't cancel the other. And that's what you get to see in orthodoxy. What does it look like to live a life that is both familiar and enchanted, that is both practical and romantic? Um, a life that also goes against this fallacy of the autonomous self. And we'll, we'll unpack this idea of the autonomous self or that those who believe in themselves are in the insane asylum in, uh, as we dig deeper into the book. His main point in orthodoxy is that we need to somehow be happy without becoming comfortable. That we need to see the whole world as a wonderland that we can be in awe of and yet also be at home in. His adventure, he says, is to become like someone like Robinson Crusoe who gets shored up on an island and everything looks unfamiliar and strange only to discover that it is actually your home. This is the same argument that he actually makes in uh, Man Alive, if you have a chance to read that novel. It's a no another novel that seems somewhat based on these ideas in orthodoxy. But here he's trying to understand what would this life actually look like? What does it look like to see the world around you in this enchanted way? The first chapter is called The Maniac. As I mentioned in his conversation with the man at the bus station, the men who really believe in themselves are all in lunatic asylums. Now this is a lot of material in one place, but this is one of those books that is very rich and you have to walk through almost every line of it. But I've tried to limit myself to less than a dozen lines from this text that somewhat give us the argument from The Maniac. So let's look at what is his argument in chapter two, The Maniac. The fairy tale, Chesterton says, discusses what a sane man will do in a mad world. The sober, realistic novel of today discusses what an essential lunatic will do in a dull world. Why does this matter for our discussion of the Inklings? Well, this is what they're all trying to do, is write these kinds of fairy tales in which the rest of the world has gone crazy. The rest of the world has gone mad. For Chesterton, everyone is walking around standing on their heads and yet they don't realize it. So when he flips you into being in a position where you feel like you are on your head, you are actually standing aright for the first time and you don't recognize it. These are the kinds of fairy tales that Chesterton wants to return us to, the fairy tales of his youth that actually made more sense of the world than much of the madness that we are currently imbibing. So what is this madness? Well, this madness is rationalism, materialism, and determinism. And he walks through these madnesses in the opening chapter of The Maniac. So let's look at a few, few quotes from this chapter where he discusses this. Imagination, he says, does not breed insanity. What does is reason. Chess players go mad, not poets. Here he's talking about rationalism. When you have limited yourself only to your reason, the madman who's lost everything except for his reason. So you have limited your world only to what you can understand. Meaning if there is nothing that you cannot understand, it does not exist. Because if you try to fit it within your system and it doesn't fit, this is where you feel as though you've gone crazy. If you've already drawn the contours of the world and you can't understand anything outside of those limitations, then everything that doesn't fit within that system makes you feel insane. Think about this in terms of Ivan Karamazov in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. He says, I live according to a Euclidean geometry. Therefore, I cannot understand this conception of justice in which the God who created the world is somehow going to bring everything into eternal harmony. It doesn't work within his system. 
And thus it makes Ivan literally go insane in the novel. He is the rationalist that goes crazy. So Chesterton is talking about this without ever referring to Dostoevsky of this madness um, that starts with rationalism, that everything looks reasonable, but is actually what makes you go insane. Now he juxtaposes this against poets, against the imagination. If you look back earlier, the chapter previously is in defense of everything else. And in this one, he talks about a set of images that he's giving you. That he wanted, in a sense, a set of mental pictures rather than a series of deductions to state the philosophy in which I have come to believe. I didn't make up my philosophy. God made it. Humanity made it. It made me. He says this in the opening paragraph. What he's talking about is imagination as a way of knowing and accessing truth. If you haven't written that down, you need to write that down. Imagination as a way of knowing and accessing truth. Truth that is not accessible according to empiricism, according to rationalism, according to logical deductions, but truth nonetheless. He talks about the confines of the system in this next quote, how much larger your life would be if yourself could become smaller in it. If you could really look at other men with common curiosity and pleasure, you would break out of this tiny and tawdry theater in which your own little plot is always being played. And you would find yourself under a freer sky in a street full of splendid strangers. Here he's still talking about rationalism, but he's talking about its, its confines within the autonomous self. So the editor who had said, there goes a man who will succeed because he believes in himself, Chesterton saw as a fallacy. To believe in yourself is to limit yourself more than the person who believes in the world, who believes in God, who believes in things outside of the self. That kind of limitation is going to narrow your world. Again, to go back to Brothers Karamazov, because it's hard for me not to. Um, in Ivan Karamazov, he actually limits himself and the author shows this by literally confining Ivan to his room in which he's arguing with himself and his other half of his self, the demonic, and they are sequestered. The world has closed in on Ivan. In contrast to this, you have Alyosha, whose world has become bigger, so much so that he walks out of the monastery and the sky feels like it's enveloping. It feels like it's moving him out beyond himself and the stars seem bigger than they ever have before and he wants to lay on the ground and hug the whole earth and kiss the earth and wrap his arms around it it is a um, move that enlargens one's perspective not confines it when you only believe in yourself and your ability to know everything you can't fit god within that conception as flannery o'connor would say a god who is less than what you understand is no, no god at all and so this is what Chesterton's trying to break us free from. There has to be something to believe in that is larger than ourselves. The things that cannot be known only according to our reason include things outside of the material reality. This is what leads Chesterton to argue with materialism itself. The Christian is quite free to believe that there's a considerable amount of settled order, inevitable development in the universe. But the materialist is not allowed to admit into his spotless machine the slightest speck of spiritualism or miracle. When we get to that hideous strength, you'll see the character McPhee, who is a rationalist and a materialist, and when he tries to understand the stories that Ransom has told him about Eldils and about you know, fighting angels and warring supernatural powers, he has no place to put it in his, in his way of conceiving of the universe because he's so limited by the material reality. For example, when you have um, a cancer patient who, defying all of the doctor's reasons and logics, seems to suddenly have recovered. It's miraculous. The cancer never returns. It's a miracle by all ways of looking at it, unless you are a materialist who doesn't believe in miracles. And then you have no way of explaining it. You have no conception outside of reason and materialism to understand something that defies both of those things. In other words, Chesterton is presuming that there are things we can't see, intuition, feelings about the world, a sense of something greater and beyond this world, and then materialism and rationalism can't account for those things, and therefore it is limited, but the Christian is more free and more open to consider those other things worth knowing. And finally, Chesterton talks about this not as an idea of the educated, but as the ordinary man or the ordinary person 
who has always been a mystic with one foot in the earth and the other in fairyland. This is going to be the way that all of our inklings will look at the world, one foot in the earth and other in fairyland, free to doubt his gods, but also free to believe in them. And this is very different from the agnostic. And he's making a joke here, this idea of doubting your gods. And he's talking about the idols that have become the gods for the agnostic without the agnostic realizing them. Unless the agnostic wants to enter into Christianity, he or she cannot doubt the things that he have set up as idols, meaning himself. The agnostic cannot doubt the self if the self has become prim primary, because then you would have to allow for other things to take over the throne of the self, and to do so would shatter your whole system. Whereas the Christian can always doubt his God and believe in his God and is not limited to one or over the other. And in fact, the common person, in this sense, Chesterton's referring to the uneducated layman. Uh, remember, in this time in Britain, there very much is a class system between those who are educated and those who are the workers. And you'll see this also in Chesterton and in Sayers as well. I'm sorry, in Lewis and also in Sayers. In Lewis, for example, in That Hideous Strength, um, we have characters who are more common, quote unquote, and uh, actually less gullible than the ones who are educated. And Mark Studdock, for example, one of the characters in Lewis's book, just finds this unimaginable that the educated person would be so gullible and buy into these things. And uh, one of the evil people <laughs> basically says, well, of course, the educated are the most gullible because they have a more limited imagination. They're not the mystics. They're not the ones who can account for all things. Um, they're so over-specialized that they're actually limited and narrowed in their ability to understand the world around them. So it's quite a warning coming from Chesterton, and it's a warning that all of the, uh, all of the inklings are going to hold to. Uh, you'll see this in Tolkien as well. You have who are the greatest that are able to withstand the ring of power. They're the smallest, they're the most ordinary, they're the hobbits. And so this kind of idea, the difference between the elite and the ordinary, where the ordinary are being uplifted above the elite and the world is being turned on its head is something that all of the inklings are going to do in their fiction. Finally, this image of the cross, as, told, as Chesterton has said, he is going to be writing orthodoxy with images and the the cross is the primary image. The cross is the image of the paradox. It is two seemingly opposing ideas that have come together. And yet the shape of the cross also shows that they are not limited. The cross reaches vertically to things that we cannot see. It is also reaching down, rooted into the particular, rooted into the concrete, not the abstract. And then it also opens its arms so wide to be able to encompass everyone and everything. So it is, it is holding on to the world in a sense um, by stretching its arms horizontally and also reaching vertically and rooting itself downward. And this is a very medieval idea of, of the cross. As we'll see in a lot of our inklings, they are drawn to medieval conceptions of things. So the beauty of the cross or the beauty of the crucifix is something that Chesterton plays with uh, very little here, but it is the image that is set against kind of the circular or insular image uh, that describes the materialist and the rationalist.